As we look through James 3 together, we are understanding that he begins the book by talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians who have been exiled. They've been dispersed among the places that they were familiar to. And now they're in an unfamiliar territory as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We can identify pretty closely to that, maybe at your job, maybe in your education, or with certain family members. We feel kind of dispersed at times. And so James is coming to us with this clear picture that we will experience trials and temptations in life But there is a way to understand that God is behind the scenes working to make our life good. If you've ever been in an airport, you can clearly get a a pretty clear idea of where planes are headed, the times and locations. If you've ever missed your plane, you know exactly what that feels like, rushing through the airport, home alone style, if you know what I mean. For my wife and I on our honeymoon, we literally missed the, uh, the bag check-in by two minutes. We were supposed to be there at 10.10, we got there at 10.12, and the lady was like, no, you're not getting on this flight. And I'm like, we're literally two minutes behind, we can see the airplane, like, it's right there, let us just walk on. And she was like, sorry, you're going to have to wait for the next flight out. And we're like, okay, well, how long is that? Oh, you're going to wait seven hours in an airport, and I was like, are you flipping kidding me right now? Like, are you serious? Like, you're not joking. Okay, good to know. And so at first, you get frustrated with things like that. But then when you take kids to the airport and you see that they're a little nervous about their first flight, but then when they see the airplanes taking off from the gate, they're excited to see this, and they're excited to see this, what, 90,000-pound thing just glide through the sky as if it's nothing. And it's funny that when you see these plans or these planes that take off and land, and it all looks great. Let let me just say this real quick. Um, I don't know if you are the person who likes to clap at the end when the pilot lands the plane. If you're that person, don't raise your hand. Um, We pray for people like that because it's funny. Like, my wife is one of them, so I can can talk about this. But when she, when the the plane lands and the pilot's getting there, she's just like, woo, yeah, you know, like, it's the person who claps at the end of a movie. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's the person who's clapping like, so good. Okay, be moved to tears, whatever. But like, do you have to clap for that? Like, they, like they're doing their job. You know, like the pilot is not clapping. He's like, yeah, I have, have obviously like hundreds of people's lives in my hand and I'm not clapping necessarily for that. You don't have to clap for the pilot all the time. If there's some turbulence and it's a little shaky, you can clap for it after. But if it's like a smooth sailing, like nothing happened and you're waking up from your nap and you didn't even know the plane landed, you don't need to clap. I'm just letting you know. Um, you, you can clap here if you'd like. I'm not, I'm not trying to like, denounce clapping or anything. If there's something that you hear that I say or the worship, you can clap. That's fine. But don't make a habit of it. I'm just kidding. You can do that if you want. It's just funny when people... <laughs> there you go. And so it begins. The pilot sees everything so different. The air traffic control tower sees things a lot differently too. I have a friend who went into the military and who actually ended up working in air traffic control for the military. And so I was asking him, like, what are, what are the, the different things that you're having to become aware of as these airplanes are landing and taking off? And he said, at any given time, you must be ready, not only for the planes to land and to take off, but because they're military, they're ready for an attack, regardless of whatever intel they've been given, they're ready to go. And so at one point in time, they are thinking and focusing on 30 separate things all in this one short-term memory blast where we've been told scientifically that we can only focus on seven things at one time and even for some of us that might be even a little bit less but it's funny like you can ask siri right now like which planes are over me right now and it'll tell you which planes are out in the sky above you. You don't have to do it now, do it after service. And you can see these planes that are above you. And if you've ever seen air traffic control towers and the way that they're having to navigate people, even if they can't see in front of them, they still have to be able to do this thing. And so what we see and what they see are completely different things. Theologian J.I. Packer says, the mistake that is commonly made is to suppose that this is an illustration of what God does when he bestows wisdom. To suppose that the gift of wisdom is a deepened insight into the meaning and purpose of events going on around us, an ability to see why God has done what he has done in a particular case and what he is going to do next. And so from that, people who think that this is what wisdom is, 
that if I know what happens in an airport, I must know everything about airplanes and air traffic control. We imagine that if we walk close enough to God, that we will be in God's air traffic control tower and we'll be able to understand everything that happens. If you're the analytical type, you may see the events of life, why this or that has happened, whether specific things are assigned to stop or to park or to go ahead. Maybe you've even sensed confusion in life and chalked that up to being a spiritual problem in your life. Dr. Packer continues to explain that the experience of God's wisdom is more like learning how to drive a car. I remember my first time driving a car. It was stick shift. I wish I still had stick shift. I love driving manual cars. And I don't even know if they make them anymore. But that whole experience, like my dad was telling me, um, just go drive around the neighborhood. I'm like, but me being the analytical type and the one who doesn't like to get in trouble, I'm like, but what if the police catch me? Like I was terrified that that could potentially happen. And he's like, it's fine. You, you, like just drive around the neighborhood. It's no big deal. So I did, but we live in a very hilly area. And with stick shift, you know that if you don't, if you don't get it into the right gear and you don't hit the clutch at the right time, like there's this rhythm that you need to do. And there were so many times when my car would hit the top of a hill and then just, I would kill it. And then it would just fall back down. I was like, oh shoot, this is, this is great. This is fun. I'm crying like daddy. You know, I wasn't actually doing that, but for the sake of illustration, you get the, you get the idea. When I went to take my driver's license test, I took it in my mom's minivan. Holla, like, you know, minivan life. What's up? And so I'm this 18 year old kid in a, in a minivan taking my driver's license test and immediately out of the parking lot, I hit the curb in the parking lot and jump the curb like where the people go in like to the doors like to go inside to schedule your appointment. And my instructor says, you want to do that one more time? I'm going to fail you right now. I was like, oh my gosh. Like it was my only mark that I had on my entire driver's license uh, test because I jumped a curb in the parking lot and it was great. And it made me terrified. So it was like gripping so tightly. And I think that what we can do when it comes to driving, it's important to make appropriate responses to the things that are happening that are constantly changing. You have to check your mirrors, you have to check your, your brake lights, you have to make sure that things are all working accordingly, you gotta check the oil, you gotta check your gas gauge, all those things. If you're gonna drive well, you cannot be so focused on the reasoning for the engineers coming up with this idea of red and yellow and green lights. You have to focus on responding to those lights and moving forward. We can't just think like, well, why did the engineers come up with this idea? Like there's a big fad right now about getting rid of all signals in California and doing the, turn, the turnabout or turnaround or whatever they're called. Um, I've, I've driven a few of them. They're kind of insane and they're a little scary, but that's this idea of us wanting to think philosophically behind all these meanings without actually going anywhere. Imagine being at a red light when it turns green and not going anywhere because your mind is so constantly wondering and curious, like, how did they do that? How did the engineers, the power and everything else, that, that's a great thing for another time, but not while you're driving. And so you have to simply try and see and do the right thing in the actual situation that presents itself. And so in order to drive well, you need to keep your eyes wide open to what is before you and use your head. And so to live wisely, biblically, is having a clear eye about people and life, seeing life as it is, and then to respond with the mind that is dependent on the wisdom of God. Being wise does not mean that we understand everything that is going on because we looked it up on Wikipedia or Google or whatever because the theory is, is that if it's on the internet, it must be right. If Fox News said it, it must be right. If CNN said it, it must be right. If it's on Twitter, it must be true. If it's on Facebook, it must be true. We cannot, however, let the lens of the world operate how we obey God. We cannot allow what is happening in our world and in our culture dictate for us what God is trying to reveal to us. And so the way that we are to operate then is not through a lens of wondering what is happening in the culture, but what is God trying to use me in the culture for? The world will only distort the meaning of God because it does not desire God. So we must allow the lens of scripture to determine how we understand the world. If you've ever known anything about algorithms with social media, you know that it's not what you want to see, 
The algorithms are working behind the scenes so that you see what they want you to see. They want us to see the ads that we see. Have you ever noticed that after you talk about a certain brand or something, that you find yourself on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or Google and you see an ad for the exact thing you were just talking about? And you're like, how did they do that? Well, if you read the terms and conditions, you would know that you actually gave them the permission to use your microphone on your iPhone. That's just one of those things. They want you to see only the videos they want you to see because they know what triggers you. They know how to get a response out of you. It's a calculated response that knows you will spiral down into the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. Not all algorithms are inherently bad. Most Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram algorithms will track your every move. But there's also a good thing about algorithms like the app Waze. If you've ever been in traffic, this algorithm uses your data that you've allowed it to, and it tells you how to avoid traffic. It's the most amazing thing on the planet. Although I think more people are starting to download the app that it's actually making the way around the traffic even more traffic filled. You see, the algorithm we see in scripture is straightforward to us. It curates the data for us by showing our failings and where we don't measure up, but it also provides the solution to our mathematical madness. We have life hacks, tips, and tricks on how to do life all around us. If you've ever seen an ad or a video on how to do something, all you have to do is watch a YouTube video and bam, you know everything, right? How to fix my dryer. The only way I knew how was to watch a YouTube video. How to fix my golf swing. I watch a YouTube video and I go to the driving range and try to figure that out. It's this headache of having to try to figure things out when in reality the knowledge is that there's someone else in front of me who has done the work for me, so therefore I can use the knowledge and apply it to my own life. And so we see opportunities to apply wisdom all around us, even if we're not fully aware of it. James 1.4 is kind of our thesis for this whole series as we're moving forward, because it says, let steadfastness, let, let endurance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, it's this idea of someone saying, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith one says that faith apart from works, James says, is dead. And the second faith is that faith by my works is evidence of who I belong to. And the same thing with those different elements of faith. You see those different elements of wisdom. Wisdom one says to educate yourself and to keep educating yourself and to keep educating yourself where wisdom, too, tells us educate yourself and then find out how to apply it. This word understanding in verse 13 is actually only found here in James chapter 3. And the Septuagint, it's this Greek version of the Old Testament, if you've ever heard that before, is found in this exact phrase in the book of Deuteronomy where God was telling Moses to appoint leaders to lead the nation of Israel. And so to understand who is wise, who is understanding, James is using this way of trying to describe how can we be wise and understanding. The first answer is by not doing it alone. Not doing it alone. Christianity was never built to do life on your own. It was never an individualistic idea where God was like, hey, you and me, we're going to start a little club. It's going to be great. We're going to have fun. And it's just going to be the two of us. That's why we see that Jesus, summing up over 600 commandments, when he was pressured by a lawyer, said, what are the greatest commandments in all the world? Jesus says, love God and love people. Because if it were truly just about your personal relationship to God, he would have just said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And you could easily dedicate yourself to something like that. But Jesus said a similar one like it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. We even said last week that there is no way in which we can truly love God and hate another person at the same time because that identity scandalizes Christianity. Just as we saw this contrast of faith apart from works and faith by works, James is presenting this idea that is also the case with wisdom. That wisdom is from above and that wisdom from below. In fact, through my study, I was looking at different universities that have their mission statements, like what do they believe? And so I went back to some of our oldest universities and Harvard was one that I landed on that was actually really interesting to see its origin and where it is today. Harvard's mission statement was this, 
1650, they said this, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the end of his life. Like what, what school thinks about the end of their life? Like no one, you get through four years and then you pay us. That's the end of your life here at Harvard. But they say that you are to consider well the end of your life and to study is to know God and to know Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. That was in 1650. The Harvard, the Harvard Corporation chose the Latin phrase in Christi Gloriam, which means for the glory of Christ. But later on, they changed it to one simple Latin word, veritas, which means truth. Because in their mind, truth has started to change. That you can have your truth, and you can have your truth, and those truths may not line up, but it's your truth anyway, so just deal with that in its own way. And so we have to understand that wisdom is not the accumulation of knowledge, it is the application of knowledge. If wisdom were truly about more knowledge, then the idea would be more education, more education, more education. And I have nothing against that. I have nothing against education. I think it is a beautiful thing for people who can find themselves in a world, in a field of education. I envy it because I was terrible at it. I went to a Christian school and still failed. Like, how do you do that and still become a pastor? I don't know. I did it. But you can have more wisdom even by not going to school than by someone who went to school. Parents, I'm not trying to tell your kids to not go to school. Just let, letting you know, kids, I'm not telling you to tell your parents, well, pastor said, I don't have to go to school to be smart. That's not the point. The point is that if education truly is the means to which we are hoping our goal is to accomplish this certain thing, then we would continue to go to school and we would end up in school for the rest of our lives. But human wisdom, I think, can be this. Human wisdom is the factual knowledge and the situational insight and the necessary resolve that together have the greatest likelihood of success in achieving your intended goal. The problem we are faced with is that most knowledge is not necessarily resolved by how we live our life because the culmination of information only goes to our heads and we have a hard time sometimes finding ways to apply it directly to our life. We have all this information that we're getting from different news sources or different feeds or different people or whatever, and all these opinions are being dumped in, and then if we're not figuring out how to apply it with our hands, we have this information overload, overload and Lord, I guess, that tells us what we should believe rather than looking to Scripture for what it tells us we should believe. And so our wisdom falls short because we often find ways to continue the culmination of information, to dictate our thoughts and our feelings, but rarely our actions. The wisdom of God, his general knowledge of reality, his situational insight, his necessary resolve, always succeeds in achieving its intended goal. Because when that wisdom is imparted to us by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, 2 Corinthians 5 says that all things are old, all these things in Christ have become brand new. We can walk according to that wisdom in faith. We cannot fail to attain the glory and the joy that we are told in 1 Corinthians 2 that God decreed to us before the ages. So here, here's the thing about your relationship to Christ. Not only is it not individualistic, but it's futuristic. And that when God had saw fit to send his son Jesus into this world, it wasn't just so that we could have a relationship to himself, but that we would also see this futuristic relationship to other people in knowing that when he allowed you into a relationship with himself because of Christ on the cross and because of the empty tomb, that not only was he giving you the opportunity relational, but he was always giving you what you needed in your mind as well. The capacity you have is not just like, okay, great, cool, follow me, and whatever path I take, you take with me. He's also giving you an option to discern and to understand if the path you are on is the right one. And so as he gives you this relationship, he also gives you this capacity to think for yourself. But as you see your relationship to God grow, you will see the Holy Spirit begin to convict you even more. People have said, well, what's, the, the, what's the, the point of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity? 
Well, it's, it's in its name. The name of the Holy Spirit is that it is a Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us further into holiness, but you cannot lead further into holiness without first having a relationship to Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.15 says that the sacred writings, talking about the scriptures, are able to make you wise not just for salvation through faith in Christ, but also in your relationship to others. And so notice how this wisdom functions. It's a means to a goal. Wisdom is always a good means to a good goal. The scriptures make you wise unto salvation, but it's not just a saving of your heart. It is a saving of your mind. It is a saving of your eyes. It is a saving of your hands that all things after your heart has been changed would then be reflected in how you live your life. Wisdom is the mental attitude and the capacity to get somewhere by following God. So what Paul is implying is this, that the scriptures given to us through the conviction of the Spirit of God is that it would give us this knowledge of our reality around us and the situational discernment to figure out how to apply that wisdom. Proverbs 3.13 says, Happy is the one who finds wisdom. We search for this happiness and for this fulfillment in life to experience this joy that cannot be from us, a joy that causes us to stay in that joy and to discover more of it. Pastor John Piper puts it this way, biblical wisdom is not a dead-end street leading to a cul-de-sac of misery. And so James continues in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of his wisdom. This is sort of a continuation from last week. We heard that teachers should consider what it means to be a teacher of God inside the church because they will experience a stricter judgment because their words do not just have earthly information, they have eternal implication. And so not many should become teachers. And James actually historically gives us this idea that there were rabbis in the Jewish church who during a worship service much like this one would use this phrase, blessed be he, and that was a terminology that the rest of the church understood as a way of continuing a worship of singing and praise and fellowship and things like that. But what happened is these rabbis were scandalizing their teaching because behind the scenes they were gossiping and they were cursing other people in their congregation for how they were living their life. So these rabbis would worship God during service and then slander their congregation after service. James is asking this question sort of in a sarcastic sort of way. Who is wise? Who understands? Anyone? No? You don't understand? Because he's saying if the rabbi truly understood, if these teachers truly understood what wisdom was, they would be applying it and not just wondering who's going to come up to them next asking for advice. Because he says the person with all the knowledge does not hoard it for themselves. They find ways in their good and upright conduct to apply it in life so that others can see from it as well. Like when I was younger and I would run over the sprinklers in the driveway or if the basketball fell on the sprinkler and hit it and broke it, the wisdom that my dad had given to me was, you fix the sprinkler. And I'm like, what? I'm like, no, you're crazy. Or if I broke a window, I had to pay for it. Or if I broke the drywall from throwing a lamp at it, that didn't happen. That did happen. I was a very angry, co- a very angry kid. And I threw lamps at drywall. I'm good now. Like, don't worry. <laughs> like, I'm not sure if I can trust this pastor anymore. But when I was younger, it was a huge thing. And my dad said, you're going to do that again. You're going to fix it. You're going to pay for it. And those are things that have been imparted to me. And so now when my kids throw lamps, I tell them, you're going to fix the drywall. Except they don't have my anger like some do. The whole point aside, these rabbis were mentally inferior to everyone around them. They purposefully kept the knowledge that they had received for themselves from everyone else so that everyone else had to keep coming back to them for more. It's like when an animal becomes uh, so accustomed to human beings that they're not afraid of human beings anymore. Like when a bear is accustomed to a camper trailer, 
they will find themselves inside the camper trailer. Or if you've seen that viral video from this last week, the mama bear and her cubs on top of this cinder block wall became accustomed to the neighborhood watch and these dogs start barking at the, the mama bear and then this lady comes running out of her house and pushes the bear off the wall. Like, that's, that's crazy. Wisdom would say, don't do that. She's lucky to be alive. But nevertheless, the whole point is that when we try to keep knowledge from other people, we're actually keeping them from being able to be used by God. In the church, this is also happening as well. Luke 18 is, an, is, a, is a great example of that. When we have a Pharisee, this religious leader, this person who worked in the church, and this tax collector who come to a service, much like this one, and the Pharisee, the religious leader, standing by himself, notice that, his individualistic relationship to God says in Luke 18, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you this, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts themselves will be humbled, but the one who is humble himself will be exalted. Essentially, be humble or be humbled. One of the greatest weaknesses of our modern culture is that our problems, we think, can be solved by more policy or more education, but often with more knowledge comes more sin. James, being the practical theologian that he is, shows the way to prove our wisdom is by one, our good conduct, and two, by our meekness. Meekness can be described as power under control. And so we also have to understand that meekness cannot be confused with weakness. Moses was meek, but he wasn't weak. Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. Meekness is the willingness Submit to the path that God has for you as you find it through the word of God and seeing God's providence throughout your life. And so the expression of good conduct is not keeping the rules, but it is this idea in the Greek that says that something is lovely and attractive and beautiful. And that's why the scriptures also tell us how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. How could, how could feet be beautiful? You've looked down at your feet before. You're like, oh, dear God, what happened? Having to go get a pedicure or a manicure or all these other things with your feet. Like, you realize, like, they're not necessarily the most beautiful things God created. Nevertheless, they're attached to your body, and that's what it is. The reason the feet are beautiful is not because of its physical appearance, but because of what it is applying and what is happening because of it. And so our good conduct is not just keeping rules, but it is knowing that through my loving God, tangibly done on behalf of someone else, that is what is lovely and attractive and beautiful. In fact, the Greek word for good is, the, is this word kalos, which is where we get our English word calligraphy. If you know anyone who can do calligraphy and they have a beautiful cursive handwriting, you know how attractive and beautiful that handwriting is because if you've ever seen my chicken scratch you know like that's not okay like that is not beautiful that is ugly and you need to like disperse it that's why I type more than I write because it's terrible Isaiah 50 4 through 5 says the sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I know how to comfort the weary you see the wisdom that he's receiving he's not keeping to himself it is being used so that he can comfort someone else. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. Let me stop there real quick. Have you had a, an opportunity, morning by morning, to understand the will of God? Because the will of God is found in the word of God, and when we want to hear the voice of God, we look into the word of God. Morning by morning, he awakens me and opens my understanding to his will. I wonder if someone here today might be more encouraged by that than anything else, knowing that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you will be allowed an opportunity to understand the will of God for your life. 
The sovereign Lord has spoken to me, and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. So then James goes from this gracious, meek life, like, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so lovely, and he switches gears into this super intense talk about how earthly wisdom can actually destroy your relationships, not just with God, but with others. Its motivation, earthly wisdom, is driven by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. One word to sum it up, narcissism. This is the person who cannot stand to see others succeed in life when it seems that they themselves have not also succeeded in life. This is the person who cannot be happy for you when something good happens in your life, but only looks to do the same thing or to one-up you. When you buy a new car, they have to buy a new car. When you get promoted, they find a way to make it about the one time you had to talk about business and they will attribute your success to their knowledge of how they helped you. This Greek word, erytheia, literally means a party rivalry, that it is allowing political power and ambition to rule and govern a church. We've seen it before. We've seen how a political ambition and power can run a church, but what it does as it runs the church is it runs God out of the church. Wisdom from the world finds its source in itself. A great example of this is in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve is tempted by the serpent to trust in his wisdom instead of God's wisdom, and the devil is doing the exact same thing in everyone's life today. He's trying to make you believe that the wisdom of the world can be better than the wisdom from God. But one of the most important things about growing in wisdom is perspective. Worldly wisdom views life from a limited perspective. It doesn't see life through a lens of eternity, but it looks to impact the immediate, which is best for self-advancement and self-pleasure now. That's why pornography is a huge issue. That's why there is divorce rampant, not just outside the church, but did you know statistically it's the same percentage inside the church as well? Because the world's wisdom has infiltrated the church It is looking for the best way for self-advancement and self-pleasure. And when the pastor does not reaffirm your self-advancement or your self-pleasure, we go and we find a church that will do it for us. It's a wisdom that seeks to promote itself and to assert itself in your life. And so when looking at conversations and circumstances, the question that worldly wisdom asks is this, what is in it for me? What is in it for me? This is often played out even in our marriages. What is in it for me? When marriage is viewed with this question as the ultimate goal, it finds itself in the midst of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Bell, says this, what makes a great marriage is two great forgivers. I told you last week about how I had to... uh, keep my words back when my wife was like telling me I'm sorry because we were at it and she's like you know what I'm sorry and I was like no you're not sorry she's like I just said I was no uh uh-uh you're not sorry because we're still fighting I still have more ammo loaded I got to get this off like we got to talk about this she's like I said I'm sorry I realized I was in the wrong and she kept saying I was sorry and I kept saying "Uh uh-uh no I won't I won't accept it You see, if you've done your part in asking for the forgiveness of your sins, not only to Christ, but also to your your spouse, excuse me, then you've done exactly what God has asked of you in your marriage. Because by default, we find ourselves in an attitude of selfishness. That's just who we are. That's just what we hope to achieve. Well, what's in it for me? If I'm not getting what I need, then I'm just going to go peace out and find someone else who will do that for me. What makes a great marriage is two great forgivers. And the great marriage that we have in Christ is that he is a great forgiver, and because I've been forgiven, he also tells me that I must forgive others as well. Theologian Michael Horton says, Christians should be some of the most conflicted people in the world because it is far simpler to be dead to God and to live for oneself. But Christians must struggle against their selfish ambition because they are alive to God in Christ Jesus and the indwelling spirit turns on the light to enable them to see their sin. 
So where do we go from here? Application, where to find wisdom. Number one, pursue wisdom in the community of Christians. One answer would be, obviously, here at Garden City. We are committed to helping you pursue wisdom in a way where you can understand that it's not just for you to receive, but then for you to go and share with someone else. So pursuing wisdom is by pursuing community. And there are opportunities here coming very soon to where we will have an opportunity for community groups, for small groups, for you to be a part of what's happening here at Garden City. I know over the summer, it's not very easy to do that with different vacations that are happening, and so there's not a lot of consistency. So for us as a church, we're not going to officially launch small groups until the fall, but as soon as the end of August hits, it's going to be like hitting the ground running with our small groups and getting you plugged into the community that is built for you through Garden City Church. But that's not to say that over the summer you don't have an opportunity to be in community with other people here in our church. There have been multiple people who have told me, hey, we want to open our home to a community group. I just don't want to lead it. So we have plenty of homes that want to open their houses, but we need leaders who are willing to step up, who have used the wisdom they've received, that are willing and wanting to give it to you also. The second thing where we can find wisdom is in the Word of God. That's kind of like a given. You, you have to insert that because that's where it comes from. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. This last week, I was having an issue with some anxiety and things like that. And the first question my wife asks me was, uh, did you read your Bible this morning? I said, no. She's like, well, that's your problem. I'm like, no, that's your problem. Like, I read my Bible all the time, like I'm studying for it, you know? She's like, no, you, you can't study what you're teaching on Sunday without studying the Word of God itself. And it, it's like, I know that, I get that, and a lot of church is not things that are new and fresh, it's just a reminder of the things that we've forgotten. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. There's no true wisdom apart from the testimony of God, and here at Garden City, everything is tested and brought to light by the Word of God. The third thing is that pursuing wisdom is not only in the Word of God, but it's also in the world of God. Sometimes we forget that this is the world that God created, not in how it is now, but originally. And you look to Proverbs 6, which says, which says Go to the ant, you lazy person. Consider her ways and be wise. Have you ever noticed an ant never usually walks alone or does something alone? There's always an army when there's food left out. Because they're like, bro, 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 they left the food out, let's go. Like, there's not just one ant around your food. You're like, ew, gross. No, there's like a thousand of them, and you're like, where did this army come from? The Bible itself tells us that there are dimensions of wisdom to be found in the biblical observation of our world, not just in Scripture, but Scripture is the lens by which we can see the world around us. So many lessons are to be learned from the folly, from the shrewdness, from different situations of difficulty, and it's the wonders of of the world that God has created, that this great book shows us and it makes us ponder what God is up to. Number four, we can pursue wisdom by walking with wise teachers. Not just people who are currently around us, who are more mature than us, who have gone on before us, who have been married longer than us, who have had kids where we are now and some of them have graduated, but also walking with wise teachers who are dead and reading their books and finding the wisdom that they have given to us over these different centuries. Find an old guy and read his books. Find an old woman and read her books, even if she's not here. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Like, no, duh. Like, yeah, that's going to happen. As you spend more time with something, you will become that something. God never intended us to walk through the word and to walk through the world alone because walking with the wise as you look to the word and to the world will make you wiser than if you walked alone. Number five, pursue wisdom with an eternal perspective. Psalm 90 verse 12 tells us to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom because walking near eternity makes us wiser in this world. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says, As the preacher says, it is better to go to the house of mourning 
than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. And then finally, number six, pursue wisdom by bringing all things into relation to Christ. Colossians 1 tells us that all things were created through him and for him, and in him all things are held together. So prize that wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Pursue wisdom. The Bible says, James 1, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give it to you generously. Wisdom, if it is this, is knowledge applied in our communities. To find discipleship that furthers your knowledge of God while serving others through the power of God. Wisdom is looking at Scripture through a lens where you can see what God is saying and through the Holy Spirit you can find the conviction to apply it. Because authentic faith is not a private faith. Pastor David Platt says, Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all things. But in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ. Because religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. But Christianity says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. Because an indication of a genuine faith is that it doesn't collapse when it is tested. Pastor Jonathan Edwards says this, It is not by telling people about ourselves that we demonstrate our Christianity. It is by costly, self-denying Christian practice is when we really show the reality of our faith. Because we don't have to fight the culture. Jesus has already won. Therefore, we can live with humility and gentleness and meekness and patience. So instead of putting up our boxing gloves, let us pick up our cross. Because that is what God has called us to. Because we know how the story unfolds. We know how it ends. That's, why, that's where we got our name Garden City from. Because we are expecting Christ to come again to establish his rule and reign here on earth. As heaven and earth collide, he is redeeming all things to become perfect. Because there is a place where that exists. And it is in the presence of God where we find that today. Let's pray together.